<laughs> no laughter. You can't, can you? You gotta have it right here. This is my fun. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, why don't y'all find you a red book? We're going to turn to 389. 389. It's an old song. It's by somebody called Alex something another Thomas and William Ogden. 389 in the red book. You know that one? No? <laughs> Y'all stand up and sing this song with me, okay? It's just an old, an old, an old, an old song. 389. You ready? Here we go. Hark, tis the shepherd's voice I hear Out in the desert dark and drear Calling the sheep who've gone astray Far from the shepherd's fold away There's another one that's on 374. And there's two Charles that wrote this book. You see it on both sides. I don't know why you got two guys with the same thing. There's a call comes ringing o'er the restless waves in the line. In the light, there are souls to rescue, there are souls to save. Send the light, send the light, send the light. 
Hey, Brother Jay, how about opening us up in prayer tonight, please? Seated. Good evening, good afternoon, whatever. It is afternoon, it's almost evening, right? <coughs> whatever it is, I'm glad it's Wednesday. Aren't you glad to be back in God's house? Well, I'll tell you what. <clears throat> uh, I guess my religion is just too short. I, I, have to, I have to have a refill. Uh, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Monday night, Tuesday night, Thursday night. Friday night, Saturday night. I just need an everyday thing. Amen? Don't y'all? I do. I have to open this old book and, and uh, let the Lord speak to my heart and encourage me. And we're in the book of Genesis, chapter 18. The promise of a son. We've already seen some unusual things in this book. And, well, <laughs> it's amazing how, how God unfolds His truths for us. And this story of Abraham is, is one that has always mesmerized me in a thousand different ways. And I'm sure you too, if you've read much about Abraham and, and the things that have happened and how that God, God uses the imperfect because he has nothing else to work with. And one of the things that I've always admired about the Word of God is that it doesn't cover up any flaws of those people listed in the Bible. Those flaws are readily visible. And we're going to see some of them again, and we saw some last week. But don't let these flaws uh, deter you when you read and say, well, I don't understand why God uses somebody like this. Well, it gives me hope, and I hope it gives you hope when you see God use those imperfect people. Um, and I think that as we see Abraham, one of the greatest men that's in the Bible, um, go through some difficult times, and yet God's going to continue to use him. And He's the father of the Jews, in essence. And when you look at the Old Testament, one of the things that's always sort of... Um, I used to try to find Old Testament doctrine as such. Well, the Old Testament's not really a book of doctrine as much as it is it's a book of religion. Because Judaism was, in essence, that. It, it had the foundation for a spiritual life, but the spiritual life was not given until after the fulfillment of the Old Covenant. It was fulfilled by the blood of Jesus Christ, the sacrificial lamb that was once offered once and for all. And when he sat down at the right hand of the Father, the offering was accepted, and we had now no condemnation, those that were in Jesus Christ. So in chapter 18, verse 1, we'll begin reading and remember where we just finished in chapter 17 when we saw the renaming of Abraham, and we saw this, this, this attempt for Abraham to um, change the ideology and the promise of God the Father, where God promised to extend his lineage throughout it perpetually and make of him a great nation. And of course, when God promised that it would come between his seed and Sarah's seed, he said, oh, let, you know, let, let Hagar's seed live, live forever, if you will, and that wasn't God's plan. So one of the things that has always, Ishmael is not the child of promise, and we're going to see that here in chapter 18 as we open in verse 1. And the Lord appeared. Don't you like that? Just think about it. Out of the, out of the nowhere, he stops and talks about circumcision being the sign of the covenant, the new covenant. And then the, the next words come out of the mouth of our God to the authors, and the Lord appeared unto him, speaking of Abraham, in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. And he lift up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. Now, don't miss that. It doesn't seem that Abraham saw them coming. It said that the Lord appeared. Now, by the way, the, the term Lord here many times can be used as, as someone's master or leader. But we'll see later that this is, in fact, the Lord as he, he will bring it up and he'll call him master. 
further down the, in, in the text. But it says, And he lift up his eyes, and there stood. There were three men standing there. He didn't see them coming. They were there. They appeared. It, it appears to be um, an immediate thing. He, they just appeared. That's what it said in verse 1. By the way, does the Bible mean what it says more normally? Well, I think we can probably pretty well bet on that, that that's what happened. And then it said, and when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door. Now, they stood by him. He didn't have far to run, absolutely, because here, of course, realize Abraham's not at the age to be doing running stuff anyway much. But he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor... Now, you wonder which one of these three he's talking to, because there's three there, right? Now, I know somebody's going to ask me that down the road, and I just thought I'd tell you ahead of time I'm expecting your, 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 your questions. I won't tell you that I'll give you an answer, but I'm expecting your questions. How's that? So, when he, when he speaks to them, and he says, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. This is common courtesy in Eastern time when someone came uh, to your door to, you, to visit with you. This was the, the common thing you do. You remember when Jesus, uh, when he went to visit someone one time, he came in. And, of course, uh, when he came in and the, the man began to talk and Jesus said, thought to himself and even said, you know, I walked in the door and you haven't even offered me any water to wash my hands or my feet, which was a common courtesy. So Jesus was denied a common courtesy. And, of course, this is why we see the courtesy was, was offered to most people, especially those that were considered to be of, of any particular, um, to be edified in any sense. And apparently that was the way he fell. Verse 5, And I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort you your hearts. After that you shall, after that you shall pass on. For therefore are, are you come to your servant. And they said, So do. As thou hast said. So what he's just said here, he says, you guys came here for a particular reason, and I want to be sure to minister to you and make sure that I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. And um, I want you to watch some of the verbiage here. It, it, it's almost laughable when you look at it in one sense, but if it wasn't so serious, and it is serious because now Abraham's just bowing down. He's doing the right things, and maybe I'm sure for the right reason. But look at verse 6, And Abraham hastened unto the tent and unto Sarah and said, Make ready, ready, look at the word, quickly. All is being done quickly. Three measures of fine meal, knead it and make cakes upon the hearth. Now, they did not have microwaves then. So this, she, he says, do it quickly. And that simply means as quickly as possible under the circumstance. But this, how long would it take someone? I want you to, let's get the timing here. How long do you think it would take somebody to put some meal together, you know, and, and some whole cake bread, and we'll call it that, and, and put it on a, on a hearth maybe that was already heated. Shouldn't take it too long for it to, to be prepared. But now, he said, hurry up and get the bread ready. And then look at this. And he ran to the herd and fetched a calf, tender and good, and gave it to a young man, and he hastened to dress it. Now, wait a minute. The cornbread's going to be cold, folks. You do realize there's no way he's going to get that calf slaughtered, get it dressed, and get it back to be prepared for food by the time the cornbread is done. Amen? But he still, quickly, he said, and he hastened to dress it, and he took butter and milk and the calf, which he had dressed, and set it before them. Now, I'm assuming he cooked it because it said he dressed it, but anyway, we'll, we'll make that assumption. I'm sure it's been there. And before them, and he stood by them under the tree, and they did eat, which was another common courtesy. He did not eat with them because he was placing their, their needs above his own. That was another Eastern custom. When you fed your guest, uh, you, you watched them eat, and then you eat, okay? Uh, I'm kind of glad we don't live in Eastern customs here. We get to eat together, amen? So, but anyway... So, and after that, in verse 9, then the conversations begin to pick up. And they said unto him, Now, where is Sarah thy wife? Now, he hadn't mentioned that he had a wife named Sarah. 
So we realize that all of a sudden we've got some, some knowledge is coming from somewhere outside of just having things happen. So he said, and she, and he said, behold, in the tent. And he said, the person that's talking here now said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. Now, uh, remember before, nine years before this, when this subject matter came up, um, it was a scary thing. Can you imagine now at this time? And Sarah heard it in the tent door which was behind him. In verse 11, Now Abraham and Sarah were old, and well stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women, which means she was beyond childbearing possibility. It was impossible, humanly, for her to conceive and bear a child. Don't you love miracles? I'm always reminded when God does things like this, I'm glad He's my God, aren't y'all? You don't get excited about stuff like that, by goodness. And verse 12, Therefore Sarah laughed, where did she laugh? Within herself. She, she just kind of chuckled, I think, to herself. Uh, apparently, it did, what the, from what it gathers, she laughed within herself, saying to herself, I'm sure, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also. She's talking about Abraham being old too. Now, Abraham's old, I'm old. I mean, this is just, I mean, it's, it's unthinkable. It, it's impossible. Can't you imagine that had to be the thing that crossed her mind? impossible maybe maybe that's why verse 14 is in here the way it is verse 13 said and the lord said unto abram abraham wherefore did sarah laugh saying shall i of a surety bear a child which am old now don't you imagine this kindly amazed sarah when she heard it repeated out of the mouth of this man something she was thinking he's repeating behind her and then listen this is what the lord said is anything too hard for the Lord? Don't you like to preach on that? Is anything too hard for the Lord? We always hear people saying, well, you know, that, that old boy's a hard nut. Nobody can cry. Well, let me tell you what. God's got a big hammer. And I promise you, there's no such thing as an impossible thing with God as far as God doing. The only thing that's impossible, there's several things that is impossible with God. It's impossible for God to lie. It's impossible for God not to do what He said He would do. And it's impossible for God to do what he said he wouldn't do. So all those things are part of the things that are, that are impossible with God. But he didn't say, is anything impossible? He said, is anything too hard? Is there anything outside the possibility of God? And then he makes this statement, at the time appointed. By the way, if you don't have that underlined in your Bible, I would encourage you to get something and underline if you have to borrow your neighbor's pen. Because you, one day in your life, you will need to be reminded of this verse. Is anything too hard for God or the Lord? At the time appointed, and there is appointed time, God's amazing because His timing is hardly ever consistent with human timing. And God already had the time set. He had the time set for these, uh, these men to appear, which I believe were, were deity. And uh, they had a, had a time for Abraham to answer, had a time for Abraham, had a time for Sarah to hear. You see, God is always, we hear this, we hear this phrase all the time, God is an on-time God. I don't think we realize how on time God is. And if we did, I promise you this, we wouldn't make such plans as we do sometimes. I do believe that there's nothing wrong with making plans to a certain degree as long as you make, put your sand, put your sand, put your plans in sand and the word of, will of God in concrete. Guess which one will stand up? That's the one. He said, I will return unto thee according to the time of life and Sarah shall have a son. Then Sarah denied, saying, Well, here we go again. I laugh not. And the reason she said that is she was afraid. Anyone that reads my thoughts, I'd be a little shaky too. You know, she, he has repeated what she thought. And she was afraid, and she said, Nay, or he said, Nay, thou didst laugh. Now, it's amazing that he just left it there. Or there's no more conversation recorded in Scripture. That's all he needed to say. Sarah, you lied. He didn't say it that way. He was a little more courteous. You did laugh. In verse 16, 
And when the men rose up from thence and looked towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. I have a feeling that Abraham was suspicious of them moving or looking towards Sodom because it seems that's what happened, remember, to begin with, with Lot. He looked towards Sodom. He pitched his tent towards Sodom. And now he's residing in Sodom. And so Abraham saw their attention on Sodom. And so he walked with them. And, and the Lord said to Abraham, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation. And by the way, he has. And all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. I'm not going to hide it from Abraham. You're a trusted ally. You're the person that I've chosen to use for this. And so I'm not going to hide anything from you. Verse 19, he said, For I know him. That's the part I liked. I know him. That he will command his children. Boy, let me tell you something. Wouldn't you like to have this on your, on your tombstone? God knows me enough, well enough to trust me. Whew. Listen to it. For I know him, he says, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham, Abraham that we have spoken of him. He's saying, I know. And by the way, I think there's something here that underlies the, the, the thought, at least in my mind. God knows because it's set already in the will of God. And he know. Let me tell you something. Everything that's going to happen in your life, period, God knows everything about it now. He knew before you were born everything I was born. And that's been a while. He knew it all. And he knows it all. And here, he has the confidence in this man that he's placed it in that knows he's going to follow the, and the pursuit that God gave him. And then he says also, he said, uh, where am I? Mm, okay, verse 20. And the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, two things happened here. There seemed to be a cry going up. That, that wasn't, it, this, this doesn't appear to be a prayer or any kind of uh, relief asked for because it appears that the whole, the whole town city and the whole plain of the area of Sodom and Gomorrah was given over to grievous sin. And that's what he made the mention of here in verse 20. And he said, I will go down now and see whether they have done all together according to the cry of it, which is come unto me, and if not, I will know. I thought about this today. I believe God's hearing the cry coming from America today. I am convinced that it would be very difficult for Sodom and Gomorrah to be a whole lot worse than America. You think about it. And you think about what was happening then and what's happening now. And he says in verse 22, And the men turned their faces from thence and went toward Sodom, but Abraham stood yet before the Lord. He's standing there and blocking the Lord's way. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? By the way, you and I both got to know that he's worried about Lot. Lot, his nephew, is down there. He's moved in with all of his family now in this terrible place. It doesn't take long if you have an inkling to be somewhere, you're going to wind up going there. And that's what's happened to Lot. And the question goes on in verse 24. Per adventure there be 50 righteous within the city. You know, i got to think, and maybe I'm being a little presumptuous here, but i kinda, I got to feel like that Abraham thought, well, well, you know, Lot's been down there quite a while now, and surely he's, he's, he's had to the witness of God and surely he's had you know some additions to have faith in his God because of his godly lifestyle wrong he started off with 50 you know the story and he says if there be 50 there within the city wilt thou also destroy those righteous ones and spare not the 50 righteous ones that are therein that be far from thee he's continuing to talk to do after this manner 
to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked that be far from thee. And then the key passage in the whole Bible, in my opinion, one of them at least, asks this question, Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Let me guarantee you he will. And let me guarantee you something else. That sends shivers up and down my back. Because if God did right without grace being an intervener, we'd all be in hell. But he did right because he chose to extend grace to us. And he said this simply, and I'll paraphrase it here. The only righteous there were those who had committed their lives to God. And so he says, don't worry. The judge of all the earth shall do right. And by the way, he wasn't listed here as the Lord or, or God. He was called the judge. And he is that. And by the way, a lot of people still don't believe God judges sin. Well, believe me, he does. Amen. And then in verse 26, he said, And the Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. And Abraham answered and said, Behold, now I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, uh, which am but dust and ashes. Peradventure, uh, there shall like five of the fifty righteous will thou destroy all the city for lack of five. And he said, If I find there forty and five, I will not destroy it. It makes you wonder why he's doing this countdown unless, it, I, to me, it shows wonderful patience that God has with Abraham. And he's just letting him go. God already knows how many are righteous there, right? He knows. But he's, 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 he's teaching Abraham something and also extending to me. Um, <laughs> you know, you just want to say, well, Abraham, just hush. God take care of it. You know, but he, he's pleading also. And then he said, okay. And he spake unto me yet again, peradventure there be forty found there. And he said, I will not do it for forty's sake. And he said unto him, oh, let not the Lord be angry, or let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak peradventure there be thirty be found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find thirty there. And he said, behold now, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord. And you, 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 you want to say, get to the point, son. And he is. He's getting closer. But he's, you know, it's amazing. One thing I love about Abraham here, he's not being presumptuous toward God. There's a wonderful lesson hid in here. Pres people today, sometimes, let me tell you what, you need to be very, very careful what you blame the Holy Spirit for. And, and, and presumptuousness will, will, is an amazing pride issue. It, it isn't faith. Presumptuousness is pride and arrogance. Faith is very meek. Faith is trust. And trust is never based on how great we are. It's based on how great God is. And so he said, and Behold, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord peradventure. There be twenty found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for twenty's sake. And he said, Oh, let the Lord be, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak yet, but this once. Peradventure ten shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for ten's sake. I believe right about here, Abraham said, Phew, I was beginning to get concerned. Because maybe Lot, all of his family, certainly there would be ten there. And we'll see just in a minute. And the Lord went his way as soon as he had left off communing with Abraham. And Abraham returned unto his place. With it stopping there, one of the reasons that you'd think that maybe in Abraham's mind, everything's okay. No more talking about it. But let's pick up in chapter 19, verse 1. And there came two angels to Sodom at evening, and Lot sat. Now, by the way, these are two messengers. That's what the word angel means. And they sat at the gate of Sodom. Or, excuse me, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Behold now, my lords, again, this is a small L, turn in, I pray thee, into your servant's house, and tarry. You notice there's only two. Where's the other one? Well, we, he's doing God business, I have a big feeling. And said, I pray you, your servants, turn into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and you shall rise up early and go your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. And he pressed 
upon them greatly. And they turned in unto him and entered into his house, and he made them a feast and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round about, old and young, all the people from every quarter. They had a crowd of folks in, at their front door. Everybody, it says, all of the people from every quarter came. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came in to thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may, look at the word, know them. That word insinuates a sexual act. It has to do with, a, with, with the idea, in fact, if you want to look and and the book of Luke in, uh, in the New Testament where the Bible infers that when the angel came to Mary and said that she was going to have a child and she said, how could this be seeing I know not a man? And the, the inference is there that it has to do with intimacy. And really, I hate to use that word here because it seems to be way too clean a word uh, to be used here. And anyway, let's read the rest of it. And they were looking for the men. It says, bring them out so that we may know them. And Lot went out the door unto them and shut the door after him and said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Uh, behold, now I have two daughters. This is hard to read and hard to believe, but I want you to get it anyway. Lot says, I have two daughters which have not known man. There's the other inference of that word. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do you as, ye, as do you to them as it's good in your eyes. They're two virgins, my daughters. Take them and do whatever you want to do in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing. For therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. Every time I read that, I have to just shake my head and say, you know, it's amazing. Now, I, I realized all the, all the, you know, the, the Eastern philosophies. And I realized people are saying, well, he was trying to choose the less of two evils. It's hard for me to consider this the less of two evils under any circumstance. But nevertheless, I won't get my foot in God's mouth. I'll leave it there. But he says, and they said, stand back. Now, listen. This is how debauched these guys were. They were so intent upon a homosexual activity that they bypassed two virgins. Now, I want to tell you something. You're talking about sick, sick, sick. You can't get a whole lot worse than that on both sides. But look at it. Continue. And they said to Lot, stand back. And they said again, this one fellow came in to sojourn, and he will needs be a judge, talking about Lot, he came to sojourn, but now he's taken up residence here, and all of a sudden he's got the answers to everything, and said, and now we will deal worse with thee than with them. And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break down the door. They were ready to lynch Lot in order to get to these men. But, ah, but, aren't you glad God puts butts in difficult circumstances? I love, but God, always, when you see that. But the men pull, put forth, the men that were visiting with Lot, the angels, the messengers, put forth their hand and pulled Lot into the house to them and shut the door. And they, the angels of God, messengers of God, smote the men that, had, that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great. It appears that everyone outside was a man. Look, it says all the people, but he tells here that he struck the men at finding them so that they wearied themselves to find the door. They couldn't even find the door. God caused to be blind. And the men said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides son in law and thy sons and thy daughters and Whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place. For we will destroy this place. Because of the cry of them is waxen great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord has sent us to destroy this place. And Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-laws. This is a sad, 
sad commentary. Which married his daughters and said, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. He had no testimony in his own house. They wouldn't believe him. The Lord's going to destroy. Oh, I've heard that, some of that old junk. I hear it all the time. Jesus is coming soon. Jesus is coming soon. Yeah, I had a guy tell me that here about a month or so ago. I've always heard Jesus. Jesus ain't coming. Jesus don't care about this place down here. I said, boy, you're in for a shock. He's coming whether you believe it or not, whether anybody else in the world believes it or not. doesn't matter. Believing he's coming has nothing to do with him coming. It's coming anyway. Here we find this. He said, oh, we just, we, that old, he's an old man. Don't pay any attention to him. Maybe when we get old like he is, we'll be like he is. Hope not. In verse 15, and when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, arise, take your wife and your two daughters. And by the way, that's all they are which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity or the punishment of this city. And look at verse 16. And while he lingered. Do what? While he... Hello, I mean, do we need a brain transplant or something here? God's just said, I'm going to store this place. I'm trying to get you and your family out of here. And the Bible said, and while he lingered. The men had to actually lay hold upon his hand and upon a hand of his wife and the hands of his two daughters and the Lord being what? Aren't you glad he's merciful? There's another wonderful picture of our God in the middle of all this. You know, honestly, my goodness, that's the way we were, folks. You know, I, 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 here I am talking about, you know, Lot and his lingering, holding back. How long did God deal with your heart before you surrendered to Christ? You know, we could... We could put ourselves in a mess there, couldn't we? You know, And then he says, and, and the Lord being merciful unto him, and they brought him forth and set him without the city. And it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad that he said, Escape for thy life. Look not behind thee. And by the way, he always means what he says. Neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain. We'll talk about that one a little bit. Lest thou be consumed, and Lot said unto them, Oh no, not so, my Lord. Behold, now thy servant hath found grace in thy sight. And here he is, he's leaning on grace like we do a lot of times. says, Thou hast magnif magnified thy mercy which thou hast, sh hast shown unto me in saving my life. And I cannot escape to the mountain lest some evil take me and I die. Hey, guess what? He's going to wind up in the mountain anyway. What is this? He wants to be in the city. Even a small one. Look at it. Behold now, this city is near to flee unto, and, and it's a little one. And oh, let me escape thither. It is, not a, is it not a little one? And, and my soul shall live. And he said unto him, See, I have accepted thee concerning this thing also, that I will not overthrow this city for which thou hast spoken. I'm going to let you leave it. Wait a minute. Understand that city was intended to be destroyed. That means that the same kind of people that was in one was in another. Are you there? But he said, uh, I, we're going to leave it here. Haste thee, escape thither, for I cannot do anything until thou become thither. Therefore the name of the city was called Zoar, which means little or little one. And the sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered Zoar. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities. And that which grew upon the ground, even the, even the vegetation was destroyed. But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. And Abraham believed the scene. Go to the next one. And Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord. And he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain and beheld, and lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham 
and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow. You now know why Lot was spared. It wasn't because of his great testimony. We saw that. It wasn't even because of his faithfulness to God. It was because of Abraham. Why are you and I spared? Not because of us. Because of Jesus Christ and his mercy. And sent Lot out of the midst of the overflow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot dwelt. Let me stop there. There's a whole lot that I, um, I want to pick up in verse 30 and following it. And if I finish up the rest of these verses, we'll, we'll be running late. I want you to read the rest of them anyway. Read the rest of them starting with verse 30, and you're going to find some terrible, terrible things. How many know that there's two tribes that have always been in, at odds with Israel? The Amorites and Moabites. We're about to see the birth of a terrible circumstance. And bring, by the way, Sin always produces sin. Don't ever think it doesn't. Debauchery always produces debauchery. Whatsoever you sow that, shall you also... Yep. So look at that when you read through it. And then pick up and continue to read uh, through 19 at least next time. Or excuse me, verse chapter 20 and chapter 21. Because we're going to get to laugh again when Isaac's born. Amen. Anybody have a question? Yes, ma'am. Uh, they are actually the foundation of the, let me think, the Moabites and the, and the Amorites are basically, I don't really know who, what their kin are today as far as their, I know the Ham, Shem, and Japheth, I know that, that Ham and Shem and Japheth, I know the progenitors of the race, which were, of course, Noah's three sons. Uh, Ham, we know that they were basically the eastern Eastern and uh, the darkened colored of humanity is eastern part. And then there was Shem, of course, who was the, um, I believe they were the progenitor of the, the Jews. And then Japheth was the progenitor of the Gentiles. Primary. That's the only three. If you go down, I could probably trace out. I'll try to have that answered next time I come. Anybody, you know? You knew I was going to do that, didn't you? Thanks a lot. <laughs> I don't know, but I, I will check it out and see what we come up with. Chuck says, that's why I sat on the front. Boy, I get it every time. But I, listen, um, it's a wonderful question because if you trace them down, I know that Moab was called God's wash pot. She was a very difficult, a rebellious, idolatrous people. And I don't know where they are as far as today. I'll try to trace that down. There's a good question. Anybody else have one that I can't answer? Jay, I'm sorry. Well, that can be that can be looked at. That we know one of them was the Lord. Now we only saw two go into the city. So I, uh, you know, we can be we we have to be philosophical or just guess. We can see the type that's there, and since the Bible doesn't say, I I really don't want to do a lot of conjecturalism, but I do believe certainly that he was speaking to Yahweh God when he was speaking to him. So the, the word Lord, capital L there, that's how it actually reads. So uh, I know God was in there, and the other two, they can be looked at, at the Trinity if you choose to, but I, I can't find enough biblical evidence to put it together. So good question. Anyone else? Okay, we'll get right on into it. This, By the way, there's stuff in here that you didn't know, aren't there? There's stuff in here I didn't know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Smaller, yeah. That's why I said I believe God wasn't there. I believe He sent the two witnesses there. Small letters, yes. The Lord really meant people in charge or people of honor. That's what the phrase Lord meant, unless it's capitalized. Yep. Okay, Brother Tony, if you'd come and take our... <laughs> 